Um, I'm Lee Alexander. I am a video games journalist and not a professional at making slides. Um, <laughs> so I hope you don't mind my childish and crude slides. Um, so in video game journalism, my work is somewhat different than that of others who do that job in that rather than writing about games as products, um, which would be previews, reviews, um, consumer reports type stuff, I write about them as a business and as a culture and as an art form um, when appropriate. I study and I analyze game design, I look at industry trends, and I also try to do editorials that explore our emotional engagement with games, uh, the way games communicate, tell stories, and things like that. Um, I love my work, um, and I'm pretty proud to be doing it, because like everyone who's here today, I really believe in the power of play to have a meaningful effect on people, and that digital games can become and sustain broad, lasting, and relevant cultural and economic impact. So, let's say I'm at a party, and someone asks me, so what do you do? I say, well, I'm a journalist. And they say, about what? And I say, social media, or uh, interactive entertainment, because it sounds cooler. Um, I don't say video games, unless I don't like the person who's talking to me and I want them to go away. <laughs> this is partly because your average person on the street tends to have a narrow, um, commercialistic view of what video games are. Um, if you do work in nonprofit or uh, education or academia, and you're working with games in some way, and you try to tell people that you're trying to use games to create a better world, you've probably encountered some similar misconceptions. Raise your hand if you've encountered misconceptions from people about games. Everybody, thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, if you're in Games for Change and you're working in games for social good, you're not doing this kind of game. These kinds of games are, you know, they're a little silly, they're fun, but what we do is educate. Um, games for change are different, uh, we say. Uh, people making games for social good are uh, changing games. From here, we can birth games that are political, that are transformative, that motivate positive behavior. Now, all we need to do is figure out how to make them engaging and fun and playful. And we can solve that problem. You might even be the first person to solve that problem. Round of applause if you agree with this. Yeah? Um, so the thing is, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. I hate to say. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not the first person to come to a serious games event, um, quote, and talk about the existing game development industry and the systems and practices that it has already discovered and defined. Just in case, I'll say it again. If you want to make games in any capacity or work in or with games in any capacity, you should know about games. You should play them. Um, it takes the same basic skill set and knowledge base, both technically and in terms of concept mastery, um, to make a game about chainsawing zombies as it does to uh, make a game about solving hunger, fundamentally. Um, in both cases, you're trying to create an experience that provokes a reaction. Um, but one of the things I actually want to do here today is to unpack the idea that games are some framework through which we make socio-political issues accessible through fun. I posit the games are already political, and we need them to become more so. And whether you make games for provocation or entertainment, I think that all game design needs right now to look further than the simple desire for fun. So when I say games are political already, what do I mean by that? Um, I'm going to talk about myself for one more second, and I hope that's OK. Um, I work in games, and I am a woman. I'm also mixed race and not especially heterosexual, but in the game space for most of my six, seven year career, simply being a woman has been enough to generally divest me of a lot of privilege in my professional space. And that's true for a lot of us. Um, it's sort of interesting to me to hear people talk about games as potential agents of great social revolution when even within games as a field, we still have some systemic um, oppression problems that we've only just begun to scratch the surface of solving. Um, we have our work cut out for us, because um, video games <laughs> have for quite a long time been the province of the privileged. Um, playing games requires expensive hardware. Um, making games has historically required education, at least some specialized skills, and access to expensive hardware. Um, the video games of my childhood were mostly escapist power fantasies um, designed to appeal to people whose lack of power is usually mild enough that it can be solved by a simple fantasy. Um, in high school, being a, a little bit geeky felt like the cruelest fate in the world, um, like something that you needed escaping from or protection from. Um, there are a lot of people who are still attached to that mode of viewing games, even though they are now adults. 
So today, um, we have a commercial games industry that was mostly, you know, the largest vertex of the commercial games industry, I think it's fair to say, was mostly founded by white guys who grew up with a Super Nintendo and a Game Boy, possibly a Sega Genesis, and a persecution complex. Um, <laughs> empathy is not something I generally um, have given them credit for building too much yet. And uh, empathy is basically the quintessential component in motivating and creating positive behavior. Um, the commercial space is changing, mostly because console business models are, uh, are decreasingly sustainable unless the audience grows bigger, and also because games are possible on more platforms and in more formats than ever before. We're in a watershed age for participation, thanks in part to new interfaces like my friends or you know, my non-gaming friends or a parent or a relative might be intimidated by a games controller with you know, two sticks, a D-pad, four triggers, but many people have a smartphone, even an infant can use a touchscreen. Um, however, in game design and development traditionally, um, prejudices against outsiders are still fairly rampant. Um, we're all here because we want to use games to create change, but I think you know, based on my experience, I think it's fair to say that the core of games creation still um, broadly fears change. Um, when I participate in Games for Change, and I have done um, for many years, it was actually one of the first, uh, one of the very first conferences I covered as a video game journalist, um, I'm asked why there aren't more traditional developers here, there aren't experienced game developers generally um, broadly migrating into the social good space, like, do they not want to do something nice? Like, why aren't they here? Um, I think it's because um, asking them to do that with their ability feels a little like asking them to change the identity they have always known, which is, tends to be related to like dragon armors and saving throws and stuff. Um, so Nintendo's Wii, for example, sold millions and millions and millions of units. I, I lack the grasp on number concepts to always remember how many units that console sold. Um, it brought lighthearted play into nursing homes, living rooms, um, you know, dormitories, anywhere. Um, it, brought, it brought gaming to entirely new audiences. This is in part because it had motion controls, and while the design application of motion might be somewhat limited over the long term, it was cool to see such widespread adoption and acceptance of games. Yet, I heard when I would attend game development conferences, a lot of traditional developers um, continuing to be crabby about this di diversification, saying that Wii games or social games or anything like that were dumbing down games, like accessibility is, is a bad word or an insult to the medium. Um, if excessive, my definition of accessibility is making games as a medium welcome to people who haven't historically been invited to participate, um, and if game makers equate that with dumbing down, what must they think of me or my friends or you as an audience? Um, there are many, many examples of games being hostile to people outside of their core. Um, you've heard some stories, I'm sure, and it happens to me all of the time. There is someone on the internet who appears to tell me to return to the kitchen every time I raise my voice too loudly. So, why am I talking about the commercial games industry when that isn't really why we're here? Um, one reason is that, for me, given how hard it is for me and many of my women colleagues just to exist comfortably and safely in what is supposed to be our own professional and creative space, it's, it gets a little difficult for me to think about using video games to change the lives of women half the world away just yet. I mean, not that that's a bad thing and not that we shouldn't aspire to that, but I, I'm acquainted with video games as, as being something with a lot of problems it needs to work out before, before it starts saving people. Um, because the games, especially because the games that have really changed me often were the result of creators rebelling against that traditional environment that told them that they couldn't participate in games. Um, I've always believed that the way to broaden games and increase their power is to enable and to encourage variety within the game creation community. Um, more people making games about things that entertain or touch or puzzle them rather than the same people making games about the, the same things that games have always been about. Um, in fact, I guess I would say I sort of feel like democratizing games is a moral imperative. Um, games as a medium are not doomed to be big budget male power fantasies or corny also rans to film and television. We know that they can educate and motivate, but they can also be expressive and individualistic. They can be used for communication. The last one there, um, expressive, individualistic, communicative. I think that definition or that, that desire for me with games is probably the most important for our purposes. 
Expressive communication is where we derive empathy, and empathy is where we derive positive change. Um, again, I say many of the games that have changed me were not created with an explicit philanthropic purpose. They were not commissioned by a charity. They were not made in consultation with psychologists necessarily. Again, not that that's a bad thing, just to demonstrate that there's more than one way. They did not, against all wisdom, focus on attaining measurable and actionable statistical results. Um, the games that I feel have made me a more charitable human being um, and have helped me um, in an ongoing transformation into someone who tries to help create a better world um, for the people around me. In many cases, those games came to pass because more tools became increasingly available for free or cheap online with fewer barriers to people who did not previously have access to game creation tools. Um, through accessible game creation tools, people now have voices who did not have voices before. Um, I wanted to tell you um, about just a couple of the games that changed the way that I looked at the world or that affected me in a profound way such that I made a commitment to creating change in, in my world. Um, they were, a lot of them were, all the ones, there's, there's so many of these, I've got like three or four to tell you about. Um, a lot of these are recent, like within the past couple of years, were made by individuals or very small teams at minimal to no expense to the best of my knowledge. Um, so this is Anna Anthropy. Uh, she's a designer and an author. She's a very prolific independent developer that I know many of you may be familiar with her work. Um, a lot of her work deals with themes of otherness and relationships and identity. Um, pretty recently, she wrote a book called Rise of the Video Game Zinesters, which is about how game making can and should be for everyone. Um, about last year-ish, I think, she made a game called Dysphoria, which is it's inspired by the kind of mini-game construction of like WarioWare and stuff like that. Um, using a lot of the immediately recognizable and tactile visual vocabulary of video games, um, she created a game that expresses her experience um, taking hormones for a gender transition which is something that I will not experience in my life, but getting to play her game, which was so simple and delicate at some times, and at other times it was confining and frustrating. You're gonna fail at a lot of the mini games. Um, you're gonna feel clumsy, and like something's rushing by you before you can master it. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that those are emotions that she as a creator was hoping to share with players so that they could relate to, to her experience. Um, and I, you know, through playing that, I learned about an experience that I wouldn't have myself um, I experienced compassion for a challenge that I, you know, might otherwise not have been able to relate to in any way. Um, Dysphoria was nominated for Excellence in Narrative in the Independent Games Festival just a few months ago. Um, this is Depression Quest. Um, it's by Zoe Quinn and a couple of her collaborators. Um, it's a text-based game where you play the part of someone suffering from depression. Um, just by clicking choices in the story, you experience in very clear terms all the ways that depression can impair a person from functioning in the way that they would like to. Um, there are very well-made vignettes that display depression's impact on relationships with partners and family, and the challenges of negotiating therapy and medication, um, including discomfort, misconceptions people have about seeking treatment. Um, most interestingly, as I don't know if you can see from the slide, but the choice-based interface um, often shows all the ways that sufferers don't feel like they have a choice, or how those choices feel sensible, but not attainable and out of reach. I could see you know, this game being shared. Let's say if you are a sufferer from depression, you can, you can share it with a friend so that they understand a little better why you can't just cheer up. You know, I, I think that would be a good use for this game. Um, as far as I know, it's made mostly in Twine. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Twine, but it is an absolutely free and incredibly flexible text-based tool. It's about as easy to do a very simple game in Twine as it is to make a web page. It's actually easier. Um, I can make a simple game in Twine, and my technical proficiency does not extend beyond basic HTML. It clearly doesn't include making slides, even. So um, so the fact that existing in the world alongside others is a challenge for some is also um, one theme you could get from Merit Kopis's limb, which I won't spend too much time on because it's here at the festival, I think. She has also done a lot of highly personal Twine games. And she was recently here at the Different, different Games conference. Um, was anyone attending Different Games? Yeah, a lot of you did, I guess. Um, she was teaching others to do these games. I really like her work because it has a, a candid and intimate tone um, that makes me feel connected to whatever she's trying to express. Um, this game is called Cart Life, and it won the Independent Games Festival earlier this year in several categories. Um, in a similar way to Dysphoria, it sort of plays off the expected aesthetic of games, um, perhaps in order to subvert it a little. Um, it has this coarse, bleak color palette. 
Um, what I find really special about it is that we're used to life sims as a genre, stuff like The Sims or Sim City or Sim something. A lot of people working in the social change space immediately default to the life simulation model um, to try to uh, model real world conditions um, in the hope that, you know, sort of an RTS about an issue will create empathy. Um, it's common. Um, Cart Life is also a really interesting choice of title. It's very unassuming. I've actually, when, before anyone had really known anything about it, I saw everyone calling it Cart Life with a K, like Mario Kart, like it was going to be a game about carts. Um, but Cart Life is actually about being a person of economic disadvantage. And um, operating, operating an urban street cart is basically your most reasonable income choice. You choose from, um, I think ultimately you choose from three characters. Um, and you get this cart, and you have to go about your business every day managing the cart and act out every um, basic gesture of, of your life, pretty much. Um, and your life doesn't stop. You don't get prompts or a manual to tell you that you have to eat or pay rent or pick your child up at school. Um, it's very impossible. You know, it's, it's nearly impossible to feel like you're succeeding at it, and that's the point. Um, it's grueling. It's hard to play. It's almost maddening to me. I, got, you know, I had a very um, unhappy reaction playing it. Um, and yet I loved it. And everyone loved it because it's an act of storytelling that simply illuminates the humble victory of getting up in the morning, of getting through your day without you know special comforts or privileges. Um, so as I said, Cart Life um, won the IGF, and um, Richard Hoffmeyer, who made this game, used the opportunity of his awards to let a friend who hadn't um, been nominated set her game up in his booth. He like defaced his own booth so that his colleague Porpentine, uh, who's another independent game maker, could show Howling Dogs, which is this bleak, touching, gorgeous dark text game about living in confinement, um, about becoming lonely, slipping in and out of, of surreal memories and experiences. Um, so while her game was in the booth, I went to go interview Porpentine about Howling Dogs. I'm kind of ashamed of this question now, but I asked her, you know, how did you come up with wanting to make a game about bleak confinement in an incomprehensible world? And Porpentine, who's a queer woman, she looked down at her hands and she said to me something like, it's been my whole life, and I, you know, I can't forget that, that stays with me. Um, I learned more about her feelings by connecting with her through an expressive game that she made on her own than I would have through literally any other means. Um, so now I can think about her and about other game makers um, that I've become acquainted with through their expressive individualistic works um, when I'm trying to do works that I hope ideally would contribute to a games industry where nobody feels confined or excluded and I, I don't think I'm the only one who's been affected in that way by, by this game. Um, so Porpentine helps create a community of indie game developers and tries to help share their work with the wider uh, world of game fans. Increasingly, people are doing that now. Um, this is a website you should write down if you've never heard of it. Um, there are more amazing personal works on it than I can count. And every time I go to this site, it's just so wild, I think this is why I do video games. Um, so the games I've described are about um, gender dysphoria, mental illness, prevailing in poverty, enduring alienation. Um, these are not fun games. They have not been made with the intention to necessarily educate or entertain me. Um, I can't measure how cart life impacted me by how much time I spent in front of it or what I did when I finished. Um, I am not even put words in their mouths, but I think the creators of all of these games would say that they made the games because they felt they had to, because games are how they express themselves. And because if they don't get heard, the people they care about and others like them are not going to be represented in the game space. So if you are working in social change games, let's say you commission a development studio to make a game about an issue, um, if you gather funding to pay them from a charitable organization who will have their branding on everything, who will ask you to send them engagement statistics and all of this, and you will have a project you feel good about that makes your efforts look modern and engaging. But if you genuinely want to use games to help others, I believe that the best possible thing you can do is to put tools into the hands of people affected by the issue that you're working on and, and encourage them to express themselves. Um, give a voice to people who haven't had a voice and teach them how to write an interactive story. Provide software licenses for a classroom. Um, work with teachers. Let students make a game about a problem in their lives, maybe. Watch them play one another's games and see what they learn about one another. Um, Baby Castles, for example, helps young people learn to build and share physical arcades so in order to create a healthy culture of play in their community. Um, viewing the creation of games in this way, I think, serves respect to what games are and enriches games as a medium and embraces play in all its forms as a social behavior. Um, for too long now, as I said, games have been a medium for the privileged. Unfortunately, in a lot of ways, it seems sometimes to me like philanthropy has been for the privileged too. And in both cases, I think we want to disrupt that. 
Because here's something that tends to feel strange to me. Um, these games that have changed and mobilized me, um, that have caused me to commit myself to doing positive action in the world, a lot of them are made by designers who are devoted to expressing their experience through games, who are artists, and as we know, artists are not rich. Um, often they're working from a place of underprivilege. Um, the meaningful and culturally relevant work they do is not lucrative. In fact, it often costs money, travel and speaking and things. They do it devotedly, at great sacrifice to their own comfort. And in some cases, they do it because it is the only thing the world allows them to safely offer. You know, some people, you know, they tell me I don't know what I would do if I didn't make games. Games are what I do. And, and I think everyone should get to do, you know, what they feel passionate about. We end up with a climate where well-heeled nonprofits are spending their money on serious games or studios to make social issue games about poverty or feminism or something. And there are, let's say, underprivileged feminists living in poverty who are making games and nobody pays them. Does that, that seems strange to me sometimes. Um, the people I know who are already making change games and have done because they need to um, are not benefiting necessarily yet from the efforts that we do at events like this. Um, like Anna, for example, um, her games have changed my life. And Anna is, you know, Anna seeks donations sometimes to make rent and she's sometimes unsafe in the world and I want to know what we're doing here that will help her and the community that she's helped lead and create and inspire and nurture, which is you know, such a good act to have done. And she's only one example. So I guess I'm asking anyone who's interested in social change games to do everything you can to equip outsiders, new voices, to make games, and to support the work people are already doing in order to be heard on the issues that affect them. Um, in most cases, we can't speak for others, um, but we can enable others to speak for themselves. Um, instead of making fun games, I would rather have people make games that mean something and that are genuine and come from a real place. Um, every, you should, if you've never tried it before, you should make a game by yourself. You know, for yourself, by yourself. Download Twine, find a tutorial online, make something. Experience how powerful that that makes you feel. And then try to share that power with others. It's magic. Um, make a game for me. I need to. I need everyone to help me diversify this game space that I work in so that I can feel like there are other people like me in this space so that I don't feel like I'm drowning in a commercial industry that wants me to go into a kitchen. Um, I used to feel like I belonged here. I want to feel like that again. Um, I need designers I admire who are making, them visi making themselves visible, sometimes at risk to their own safety, to feel like there is a community of good creatives and healthy people in love with the medium of digital play who are going to rise to join and support them. Forget fun, create empathy and truthfulness. And last night, I was talking about the subject of my talk with someone, and he said to me, well, if just anyone can make a game, what if that just results in a lot of bad games? I mean, well, it could. But unfortunately, speaking as a games critic, the serious game space has had a lot of bad games in it for years already, so that isn't anything new. At least we could have honest games. You know, At least we could have issue games that involve people affected by the issues we purport to care about. Um, maybe we can think in terms of effective or not effective in ways that aren't necessarily statistically measured, and instead of fun or not fun, or good or bad, you know, what's wrong with real or not real? I think that is sort of how you change the world. Um, I have about five minutes for questions if you'd like. Thank you. was he runs a program, it's called XX Game Jam, which was all for women developers. And you said you found a technical barrier when trying uh, to involve women. No, no, when trying to expand it out of that sphere to, um, so in schools, for example, with uh, you know, girls who might be interested in wanting to make games, yeah. does, does, well, it actually applies to, to young boys as well, you know, you get the same. But there is definitely a technical barrier. If you, if you want to make a girl, you can give them a camera, and they can just mess around with something. If you want to make games, there's definitely more of a tech gap than it was there's still some, um, but one of the things I wanted to get across today is that gap is meaningfully decreasing, and it's happening very quickly. Um, 
just as the commercial game space is uh, reaching a pinch point for how much money it can make doing very high value things, so are tools makers. Um, the, if the commercial games industry is contracting, tools makers are also continually democratizing their tools. That is happening. Um, Twine is something that I mentioned, which again, it's, you can make a text game easily. Anyone can do it. I am not proficient and I can do it. Um, you may want to find more accessible tools. If people seem intimidated by tech, you can gather people, gather women who are experienced game developers to encourage and, um, and to teach others. I think it's just sort of about approach and what tools that you choose to provide to people. Um, any, and another question? I don't know, no one has any questions. I guess I'm finishing early. Um, oh, here's one. What about free tools versus tools that cost money? Is it a good topic to Um, I think in any case, in any time you're making a game, you want to choose the right tool for the project that you're making. Um, that can be a free tool, or that can be a, a tool that requires a software license. So I guess it just depends on how many resources um, you have at your disposal and who is being involved in making those tools. Definitely check out um, free versus paid tools. You know, they, they do different things. Um, sometimes if you just want to get people accustomed, you know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes the final project isn't as important initially as having, for example, he spoke about an intimidation barrier with students. If you give them a free tool that's easy, that costs you nothing, and it gives them a sense of confidence that they can make something little, and then they can grow into making something bigger and more complex with, with tools that may be more expensive. I don't, I, I don't necessarily make a quality judgment between um, free and, and paid licensed tools, but there are all kinds of things that are possible depending on your purposes. Right. Are there any funders who are funding I wish there were. I hope somebody does do that. I would love that. I mean, I think if people are in, in the charity business and they come to games conferences, I hope they would consider maybe instead of making games, providing tools. That's something I would love to see happen. I'm not familiar with it yet. These programs do exist. Um, I've definitely heard of people um, doing student, student programs or offering uh, student versions of their tools. Yeah, that happens. But I think we can even take it you know, outside of the game development classroom and, and down to the street level and to the community level um, and have, um, you, know, you know, programs in the neighborhood where people are invited to come in and try something, try making something. Do you get props and funders or companies to talk Absolutely, tell them to email me. Yeah. Yeah, please, yeah. If you're doing anything like that, please do get in touch with me. I would love to cover it. Um, anybody else? Sir? Can I basically the same thing? Um, you talk about people who try to express themselves and their individual problems, but you know, and they come up with great games, but how do you motivate them to go beyond? Because if they've expressed their problem once and made that great game, um, and obviously, as you, as you said, there's not much commercial success, how do you go back or how do you get that art out of them to express somebody else's problem as opposed to their own problem? Well, I think that I don't I don't know if I'm, I would want to take a creator and make them make games about something. You know, if, if, if in this specific case you're talking about, he asked if someone's making an issue game about their own experience, how do you enable and encourage them to make games about more experiences? Maybe they don't need to. Maybe, you know, maybe what we need to do is sort of meet them halfway. A creator who makes a game about his or her own experience, you know, we can then, in, you know, if we're doing charitable works, connect with those game developers and help them spread their message farther. Um, I don't think, I think it's about people um, making games about issues they care about. And there's always probably someone affected by the issue that could be democratized and assisted, um, given the tools or given the encouragement, the marketing, something to make a game to, that allows them to succeed in making the games they want to make. So that's something I believe in. Um, I have one more, I can take one more question. Um, here. You're 15. Oh, she asked, how do I? What do I see the state of women in games being uh, by the time she enters the industry? I don't have a crystal ball, but oh gosh, I hope it's. I think it's going to be better for you. I think it's already happening. We're doing. We're doing everything we can, and I. It's. It's. Get, it's changing for me. Having been, I started in the industry when I was like 24, 25, and 31 now, and. I don't feel as alone anymore. I'm surrounded by, you know, not only all kinds of women, but you know, other minorities that are, you know, people with even less privilege than I am that are participating. Um, so, I think it's getting better. Every conference that I go to now has people that have well-intentioned curiosity about feminism and games. Um, I, 
I'm, I'm committed to it. That's one of the reasons why I work, is to help inspire and encourage others to, to sort of join me in making the industry a better place for women. So um, I can't promise you anything, but I, I think it can happen. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of my time. Thank you guys so much for coming and for your uh,